Welcome back to the evolution of horror. My name is Mike Munzer. As ever, I am your host. Now, usually on this podcast, we're looking at the history and the evolution of the horror genre. Uh, We are in the middle of our Nature Bites Back season, where we're covering animal attack movies and all kinds of other things. Uh, This week, we're taking a quick break from the main series uh, because, well, it was Halloween this week. It was a busy week over at EOH HQ. Um, A lot going on. So the next episode of our Nature Bites Back season has been slightly delayed. It'll be dropping next week. But I thought I would instead drop this little bonus episode, uh, the recording of my live Halloween special, which was recorded last night in London on Halloween night at the beautiful Regent Street Cinema. Uh, I hosted a live podcast discussion in front of a sold out audience uh, with the brilliant Dan Martin, Rosie Fletcher and the one and only Reese Shearsmith. Uh, And we had a really fun one off discussion in which we unveiled and opened the EOH Hall of Fame and then debated between us what movies, what performances, what scares and what monsters belong in the evolution of Horror Hall of Fame. So have a little listen. Please enjoy our Halloween live episode of the evolution of horror. Welcome to the evolution of horror Halloween special. Amazing. Uh, Well, I'm sat in the Regent Street Theatre right now um, in front of a a packed house of people. Some are dressed up. Some have got some incredible costumes on. I've seen somebody from Threads over there. I've got somebody from the... There's an amazing Tippi Hedren costume at the back with birds. Like, phenomenal. We've got long legs somewhere in the audience as well. I love the effort that everybody's made. So thank you all so much for being here. We're going to have a very special kind of one-off conversation here on stage with my panel and with the audience. So... Let me introduce my incredible panel of guests. Please welcome to the stage uh, award-winning effects artist and makeup artist, Dan Martin. Woo! Hello. Uh, Co-editor-in-chief of Den of Geek, Rosie Fletcher. Come on up. And writer, actor, just general hero and legend, Reese Shearsmith. <laughs> Hello, guys. Uh, happy Halloween. Thank you so much Thank for being here. Happy Halloween. Uh, Reese, thank you for being here. I know Halloween is an important day, an important night for you. Uh, you'd probably usually, what would you usually be doing at this time on Halloween? Like, do you have Halloween traditions? I'd be at the Sabbath. Yes, I thought so. <laughs> probably boiling a baby and kissing the devil's ass. <laughs> oh, cheers. <laughs> That's what they're all doing later on. Uh, no, I, I well, I, I enjoy the trick or treaters that come round to the house. We do the house up, so it is a beacon of um, invite, you know, because some people don't like Halloween, if you can imagine mm. that. Mm-hmm. So uh, we do invite them in, and they come in, and we kill them in the front room. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, and I'm usually dressed up in something, and then I, there is some party usually. But it's been lovely tonight be- to come here and do this because what more. Um, Halloween night could oh. you get them doing this? I know. Where's long legs? Long legs, put your hand up. Let me see. Oh, there she is. There she is. <laughs> Looking I just did it beautiful. I to do that. that is friend of the pod, Brad Hansen. He's made such an effort. Absolutely beautiful. <laughs> yeah, round of applause for long legs. Um, Rosie, hello. Hello there. Thank you so much for being here. Do you have any Halloween traditions, any films that you like to watch at this time of year? Well, a film that I particularly love, which I really feel like sort of sums up Halloween, is Trick or Treat. Oh, yeah. Which is the anthology film. And, like, I think it's kind of a snuggly film. It kind of embodies all the different wonderful things and it is like it's sweet and lovely and people get poisoned and loads of kids die and it's just really you know it's a it's a beautiful movie so i love i love to kind of cuddle up with that it's so good isn't it and yeah. something about an anthology film as well i really I, I, you that. know what? i love an anthology yeah. film yeah. yeah yeah dan hello hello thank you for being here you're usually busy scaring or grossing us out as audience members with what you do but do you, is there anything that you like to watch or anything that you like to do on halloween 
We used to do parties pre-lockdown and haven't really got back into the tradition now, which is a bit of a shame. Mm. Um, and I kind of liked being able to take a day off from... Yeah. Because I would do a costume contest and then it would feel like cheating if I took part. So I got to, <laughs> got to not work. <laughs> yes. But um, as far as watching goes, for a long time, I used to watch Bad Taste. Oh, that's good. That's um, a good one. Because it's never not funny. Yeah. And, and it's also nice and gross. Well, also, Dan... You're almost Halloween in the in reverse because every day is Halloween for well, you. Yeah. So it's like the one day. <laughs> yes, exactly. Well, we're going to do something we've, we've not really done before. Um, we're going to have a little kind of one-off discussion, like what we've just done, where we're going to kind of celebrate some of our favourite things about the horror genre. So um, I've got a little... Uh, where have, where's my clicker? I've got a little clicker here. Here we go. So uh, let's see. Here we go. So if we move on. Right. So we are tonight introducing and unveiling the Evolution of Horror Hall of Fame. This is my first panel of judges. Oh, I actually managed to sit you in the order that you're in this photo as well. Thank oh God. God. Um, so what we're going to do is we are going to pick certain elements of the horror genre, certain films, certain characters, certain scenes that we think deserve to go in the Evolution of Horror Hall of Fame. Hall of Fame. My panelists are going to put forward their choices for certain categories and you guys are going to decide which one goes in and which one doesn't, okay? So we'll explain as we go. So we're going to start the first category, best horror performance, okay? Best performance in a horror film. Uh, I've gone with a picture there of Marge from A Nightmare on Elm Street. Now, for those of you who haven't seen A Nightmare on Elm Street and you're watching it tonight on the big screen, just just keep an eye on what Marge is up to throughout the film. Like, I, I've seen it three times on the big screen this year and I'm, I'm noticing more kind of acting choices that she's making every time. So just keep an eye on that. But anyway, we're going to discuss what we think is the best horror performance. So, Reese, I want to come to you first first right. what did you pick as your sort of favorite horror performance uh, it's obviously impossible um, uh, and I dismissed lots of things I dismissed Zelda from Pet Cemetery. Oh. brilliant of course and uh, you know lots of great creepy moments Benjamin Christensen from Hagsam playing the devil but I went for and impossibly you might get a boo but I think it's right um, I went for Jack Nicholson in The Shining oh. Excellent it's choice. Perhaps an obvious choice to make, but and a controversial one, of course, because Stephen King didn't like it, and he's mad from the start, and blah, blah, blah. We all know those arguments. However, I just think him in this part, it's sort of... It is so scary. But yes, I mean, I suppose you could think he's mad from the start, but there is a lid on it. I was going to say, do you, think, time, do you agree with those criticisms that it's too big, too early? No, not it? really. I mean, it is Jack Nicholson, but I like the fact that he's sort of uh, twinkly in it and mm. j only gets worse and worse. And he's so scary and horrible to um, Shelley Duvall, of course. And that scene where she comes in and he's typing, and when I'm typing, I'm doing it. Uh, you can, I never not watch it and wince at the horror of the relationship breaking down. And and I do feel, uh, in a way, that there is that element that's in the book but, and people argue is not in the film, that you do get that sense that it's not Jack Torrance, it is the Overlook. And I feel like that, and that in, there are instances in the film where you do feel it's the building itself, the evil of the building taking over him. And that is what you want to feel. And I think that's great. It's the great tragedy of the book that you know it's not him it's that the house and he's doing this to his family against his will he's being possessed so i would say it's that and of course when you build to the crescendo of here's johnny and that's all it's sort of um in our minds now like it's never not been there but think about seeing that for the first time when the first time you did see it, it was so savage the way the camera slams across every time that door yeah. goes across and he's great in it and i just think it's one of the one of the great performances the brilliant scene when he's with grady in the toilets oh my God. mr grady and you know i just really <laughs> i could watch it forever it's one of those films like theater of blood or, or the jaws where if it comes on two minutes in 45 minutes in two minutes to the end have to watch it. So I, I think the more it. I watch it as well, like I think you, you're you're struck by the kind of the big moments towards the end, and then the more I watch it, I'm more freaked out by those little microaggressions. Absolutely, like yes. Driving at the beginning or the typewriter. Yeah. That, those are the moments when you. When go, he turns, oh. when she he, he realizes on the bed that um, she, he said about the mum saying that, and he's just talking about that little quiet talk with Danny. Yeah. And you can just see him turning, or his eyes sort of glaze over. It's brilliant. I think it's a really good, skillful, deft low-key performance in some places and i think we gets overrided by this the, the argument about hit the bigness of him but i would put forward 
Jack Torrance. Love Jack Nicholson. Excellent first choice. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, okay, we're going to come to Dan next. Dan, you've got an interesting choice. Give us your choice. Yeah, when we were in the lobby beforehand, we were not comparing notes, but <laughs> like, you know, feeling each other out for it. And, um, and Rosie said, have you chosen something really esoteric? And I think this is the one that is probably the most surprising, but um, I 100% stand by it. Um, I saw this movie when I was very young. Uh, it's a sequel. Uh, it's a very, very uh, good actor in a slightly cheesy role. Um, a reprieve of a role they've previously played. But they're doing this thing where it's a great actor playing someone who is not pretending very well. And so you've got this like two layers of performance because you've got the invisible layer that is their genuinely fantastic inhabiting of the character. And then you've got this very subtle overlay that is them lying to someone in a way where they're just pitching it so you're like, are they going to guess? Are they going to give themselves away because they're not being very convincing? And there's all these really lovely little stolen glances. Uh, it's, so it's Anthony Perkins in Psycho 3. And it's specifically... <laughs> Psycho 3 as well. And Incredible. It's, it's specifically the bit where the cops visit the house and he thinks the body of his mum is upstairs. Uh, well, the, the body is upstairs, rather. And he, and he is trying to keep them out of the house because they will discover that he's back to his old murdering ways. Um, and he's being outraged that they would even consider that he would do a murder. Uh, and he's trying to keep them out of the house. And then he is utterly shocked when the body isn't there. And then when they go back downstairs and they're outside uh, and the young, younger characters who have requested the police do this investigation are not satisfied that this guy isn't a murderer because they know he is. Uh, and so they're being outraged at the police and the, the police basically are lazy cops and they don't want to do anything. And they're like, you know what, like, it's, you know, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry we bothered you. And they're eating the ice out of the cooler and Perkins sees the fingers and the red ice <laughs> in the cooler and you're seeing the cop talk to the kids and that's, they've got that going on, but then it keeps on cutting back to Perkins, who's looking at the cops, looking at them, looking at their face, do, do they realize? And then occasionally being like, oh yeah, no, it's fine, don't worry about it. <laughs> um, and the it gets to the point where the cop's like sucking the ice and he's got blood in his teeth and he's spitting out the ice water. And it's, it's really effective performance. Mm. Um, and Perkins, am I right in thinking, he directed Psycho 3 yeah. as well, right? So yeah, he's yeah, yeah. directing that scene as yeah, well. Yeah, like you can, it's a, he's really like, really pushing everything like the perfor performance wise he's really pushing out what he can do it's a real showpiece I love, I love it. that and that stands out to you more than anything he did in Psycho 1 and 2 even like specifically yeah so in Psycho 1 and 2 he is an amazing actor giving an amazing performance mm. in this he's an amazing actor giving two amazing performances love at the that. same time I love, love that amazing choice okay and very good yeah very good choice Rosie what have you gone for for your favourite horror performance well so Initially, I, talking about someone giving two performances, I had wondered about um, two Jeremy Ironses in Dead Ringers, mm. which is a, a favourite. But I have decided not to go with that. And I've gone with something that's a little bit more recent, which I know is potentially a little bit controversial, but I absolutely stand by it. So I have picked Tony Collette in Hereditary. I, I don't think that's controversial. I well, think that's a solid okay. choice. So, so imagine this, right? So you're an actress. And your character, at the very beginning of the film, is burying her mother and giving the eulogy for her mother. And at that point, that's the happiest you're going to be <laughs> during the whole next two hours. Like, that's literally the best it's going to get. That you've basically, your mum's dead, hooray, this is basically it for me. Wonderful. So then, I, don't, I won't bore you with the plot details, but this is a performance that could be... Um, sort of extra and over, but it's not. So what she has to do is go through that, then 20 minutes in, the beheading of her daughter. So she's spoiler then alert. like... <laughs> I mean, spoiler alert, souls. Yeah. Um, but if you haven't seen it, where have you been? <laughs> but, so the beheading, the horrible beheading of her daughter at the hands of her son. So she's in the bedroom and she's crying and screaming Screaming, but she's being held by Gabriel, Gern, Gabriel Burns' character, her husband, in a way that it's like she's giving birth. Mm. The noises she's making are like childbirth noises, and she's screaming, I want to die, I want to die. And I give you a movie where by the end, you're like, yeah, you probably should have done. <laughs> like, and it only yeah. gets worse from there, but she doesn't give 
a, a, a sort of a ridiculous over the top performance. And actually, the, for me, the key scene in a film which is full of utter, utter horror is the scene around the din dinner table. Yeah. So it's this really dark scene and it's her and Pisa, her son, and Stephen, her husband, and Stephen's cooked. And the kid is like, um, oh, this is a really nice stew. And she's, she is literally stewing. Stewing, yeah. She is stewing because she can't, she can't express how she feels. And, and Peter, the son, who feels terrible, is to just say something, just say something, just say something, and then she does. And this moment where she's, he says, just fucking say something, in fact. And then she's like, don't you ever swear to me, you little shit, you fucking... And like, so basically just absolutely explodes. And her face is kind of, um, it's like love and guilt and rage and despair within moments. It's, it, it's honestly one of the most amazing kind of physical performances I've ever seen. And she does this and she sits down and he says, well, she didn't want to go to the party, mum, so why was she there? Mm. And like the bitterness and the kind of the, the, you know, the beyond sort of rage and sadness. And this, bear in mind, comes after the scene where we understand that she's told her friend, friend, uh, Joni, that she once slept walked and poured um, paint thinner over oh, her yeah. kid and nearly set him alight. And she's screaming about nobody takes responsibility. And like, it's such a clever, brilliant performance. And from, and, and then later she cuts her own head off. So, like, <laughs> on top of all that, right, so a, ha so a happy like, ending. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So then she cuts her own head off. So like, under the in the hands of someone lesser, that would have been mawkish and it would have yeah. been stupid it's and it would have been quite embarrassing. Absurd, it's a very absurd story in a way. Hereditary, it's incredibly isn't it? but it's absurd. Kind of grounded by that. Right, and yeah. it's like, and this is a story about you know Ariasta talks about how he says he he felt like his his family was cursed, mm. and she's the centre of that. You know, she is. You know, it's her mother who's brought it down to her, and you know, maybe if she had killed herself, mm. and that, how terrible is that? Like, what an awfully depressing film. But grounded by this incredible performance, and I really do think she should have been at least Oscar nominated for that. So yeah. I, I very much stand by that. Yeah. It's such a it's such a dark, bleak film. I've never gone back to it a second time, but it has stayed with me so. Yeah, so I viscerally. don't think I could bear to watch it again. It's the, the fact that they leave you hanging with the fact that no one knows. He just parks the car and goes to bed yeah. after the heads off. It's the worst thing in the world because it's, you're not let off. No one knows yet, and you're yeah. just waiting through the night for her to go to the car, and, f and then this wail of absolute oh despair. I can't bear watching it. It's again. almost like unbearable. Yeah, moment. unbearable. No, it is, yeah. and I watched it again. Mm. Thanks, like <laughs> because I promised I never would because I found it honestly yeah. one of the most upsetting. It and you're right, that so bit upsetting, with upsetting. Yeah, you know, and it's almost like yes, but that maybe is what you do, because it's when grief is so extreme. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. You know. Love this. Well, there we go. We've got three incredible choices. Now we're going to let the audience decide which of those three performances goes into our Hall of Fame. This is kind of like Room 101 style, right? So you're going to pick which of the three goes in. We're going to measure it by volume of cheers, basically. So let's begin with Anthony Perkins in Psycho 3. Okay, what about Jack Torrance in The Shining? a little bit bigger and Tony Collette in Hereditary I think we have a winner there I think Tony Collette's performance goes into the EOH Hall of Fame congratulations Rose okay. love it all right we're gonna move on to our next category and actually with the next category this is gonna be best scare okay so this is this is a big one this is the scariest or the best executed scary moment in a horror film and I might ask for an audience a, a choice as well so we might we might like bulk it out with four choices this one um, but let's see who we're we gonna come to first for their favorite scare Dan we're gonna come to you Don't what's your favorite scare in horror don't put it up straight away. Um, I was so torn, I genuinely don't know which one I went for. <laughs> so it's, down to two. It's, it's one of two, so I'm gonna be, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, I'll start with the story about how I saw it. Cause it's like, these things are, you know, as, as Rhys said about the, the performance, it's so difficult to make the choice. And I think often it changes on a, a daily basis. <laughs> but um, 
I think for the scares, it has, it's so contextual because you can watch an amazing film in bad circumstances and it, it doesn't have its effect on you. And you can watch a, a good film in the right circumstances and it becomes a masterpiece. This film, I think, is a masterpiece mm. and I watched it in exactly the right uh, situation. Um, I was still living with my parents. Uh, I would come up to London occasionally and it was at the time where there were back rooms in the like convenience stores in Chinatown where you could buy Asian discs that were grey imported um, and I would pick up stuff based on oh I know that actor or I know that director or whatever but often I didn't know anything about the films uh, and this was a Japanese film that I picked up um, in the relatively early days of, of J-horror um, and, and I'd already seen my, my other my other potential choice which was no one else chose it, right? I can just say it. I don't know. Oh, I don't. The other one. The, the one that I didn't. You might actually oh, want to save that. I'm then. going to save that. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> um, so I, uh, my girlfriend at the time was round. We'd already watched another movie. Uh, it was like one in the morning, maybe. Uh, I was like, I'm going to put another film on. She's like, yeah, yeah, fine, whatever. She fell asleep across my lap. And I watched this film on a relatively small television with like the lights dim but not off it was not perfect watching for this film at all it's audition and the moment that like i because that film is structured so beautifully and the the first half is a, an incredible director making a good drama like a good dark slightly grimy drama and then as things start to go south and you start to be aware that this is getting increasingly fucked up and you've already had the guy in the bag by this point. Oh, God. So, and you've had the... There's a tongue flapping the, about yeah, on the, the floor. The, the hot irons to the inside of the leg. Like, you know this is a messed up space, but I was not ready for the... Tiddy, 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 tiddy <laughs> moment. And I remember... She was, she was asleep across my lap and I, my hands were on my face, like tight, <laughs> like I was squeezing my own skull. I was so breathless at this moment. I just genuinely couldn't believe yeah. that this is what was happening. And I was so completely enveloped in the film um, that it was like more than possibly any other viewing. It was like, it was real. Like I was watching something that was actually happening. I forgot it was a movie God. and it was just horrifying. Yeah, this is, and um, this category unfortunately is going to be a bit spoilery for people that haven't seen these movies, right? Is there anyone that hasn't seen Audition before? Yeah. A few of you, okay. Well, we won't say too much except that it's one of those, like Dan, you've mentioned it. It's this, yeah, sorry. Oh no, it's all right. So I hope I haven't spoiled it. It's genuinely a masterpiece and it's really worth watching. Yeah. The, reason I, the reason I heralded it with the noise that I made, which will mean nothing to you, no. <laughs> is that everyone who's seen it knew exactly what I meant. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's all very, it's all in the context of watching it. You've got to go on that journey, right? It's a very slow oh, burn movie. It's and so it slowly good. builds to this. It means tickle, 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 doesn't it? It does, yeah. It does. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, yeah, it's, and, and this is a, 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 you know, like there are different types of scares, actually. We're going to see the different types, actually, even in your three choices, like whether it's a jump scare, whether it's this kind of more sort of uncanny sort of vibe, or whether it's something a bit more visceral, right? Right? And this is a very visceral kind well, of a scare. It is visceral. It's quite a gory moment. But uh, like, obviously, I work in effects, and one of the things that I I often find is that the more you show effects, the kind of the less you get the the mm. scare because you're showing the audience what's happening rather than letting them fill in the blanks with their own nightmares. Uh, and I think that the thing that's so great about this film is that it is gory. It is a horrible idea, and you are seeing quite a lot but it all feels in that moment so inevitable mm. and it feels so inescapable. It's kind of like what you were talking about with Hereditary where everything's come to this like perfect conclusion, this perfect point. And you're just like, oh fuck, this is awful, but how could it have gone anywhere else? <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah, inevitable, exactly. Reese, have you seen this one? Are you a fan of this movie? Oh yes, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Mm. It's um, another one that I would find, um, I'd be cautious about returning to. I yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it is. It's sort of extraordinary because you do not expect it to end where it ends. Yeah, I'm not not talking about it in case people get mm -hmm. cross again, shout things out. <laughs> but yeah, really good. It's 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 vile and it's prolonged, which yeah. is what's um, sort of wince inducing about it. I remember watching it for the first time and literally kind of squirming about in my seat. Yeah. Rosie, do you remember the first time you watched? This? I I do. And weirdly, I wondered if you were going to pick the bag thing because I didn't know that much about audition. And you're absolutely right. So the first sort of act is melodrama well, it's, it's, it's more it's like act and a half two acts like it's not really yeah. until mm. yeah the, and then the piano the, lessons the, flashback well that you... and, but when you see the bag move in the background and like the fuck <laughs> something's not right <laughs> like... yeah yeah it's incredible and that's a great jump scare as well incredible so there you go excellent first choice yeah. rosie uh yeah good round of applause for audition
Uh, Rosie, this is there's a few similarities potentially. Here, yeah, right? and I, w- I do wonder whether my choice is your I other think choice. It might be, yeah. yeah, okay. Rosie, tell us your favourite scare. Okay, so my favourite scare is the uh, the TV scene from Ringu. Yes. And holy shit! It's it's not a jump scare, but I would argue it's much better than that because it basically. So I'm, I won't talk for too long, but I have very personal um, relationship with this film. Um, so in short, that scene scared me into becoming a film journalist. And, that, and that's literally true. Um, but I'll come back to that and, and tell you why that, that scene is so frightening. So I'm assuming that most people have seen it. Um, the beginning of Ringo is really frightening. The middle is kind of procedural mystery. And then we get to this scene. And so we understand she, she comes out of the well. It is inexorable, if you will. Mm. And she's coming towards the screen and it's not okay and it's not okay and then she puts her bloody fingernails through the screen and it's very out. gradual isn't it's it it's very gradual it's mm. completely uncanny she stands up and we see the we see the eye and it's it's just really really frightening but it's extra frightening because of what that film has done to the audience and i mean to us because we have watched so you, you, the general just ring is that people watch this video and then seven days later they die um, but we've watched that video, but we didn't know what we were watching. So we've already seen it. So we have been tricked into becoming complicit. But also what it does is it breaks, so it breaks the glass screen. So we who love horror, we know that we're okay, really, because we're watching it on telly or on a cinema screen, and there's a screen between us. And so it's like that's the difference between things being real and things being not real, which is why... Like, for example, ghost stories in the theatre is so incredibly effective because even though we know it's fiction, yeah, but there is something in the room with you. There yeah. actually is something in the room with you. So, and this, this is a film where you're like, well, it's just a film, it's just a film, until it's not just a film because she's broken the glass screen. She's broken the pact that the audience has with film. So... It's like, well, if she can come out, then my TV's not safe anymore. And Nightmare on Elm Street that you're going to watch in a bit also does that. It yeah. also breaks the pact. It says, oh, yeah, you know your nightmares that aren't real? Yeah, they are. Yeah. And, like, it, it's breaking this pact with the audience and tricking you into having watched it, which makes this so unbearably scary. And so my, my tale of this is that I watched this before I'd watched any j Horror at all, so I knew nothing about it. I was with my um, then-boyfriend, now husband. We had been up a bit the night before, don't want to put too fine a point on it. <laughs> um, and we watched it on telly, and it honestly scared the living crap out of me. And, like, and so we both sort of went to go to sleep, and then I woke him up and said, I can't sleep, I'm scared. And he said the worst thing ever, which was, so am I. <laughs> And like, that was so awful. And at that point, I was working, um, I, I was working as a journalist, but I was writing about dishwashers and toasters and stuff, right? And, but I became so frightened and obsessed by this film that I had to watch all things J-horror and had to find, and had to read the books and had to watch, and I had to find out about the actors because I needed it to be not real because it felt so very real to me. And so then I started writing for a website and blah, 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 wow. to the point where basically I just talked myself into becoming a film, <laughs> a film journalist critic. <laughs> because that film scared me so much. So I love there that. you go. That's it's, my, it's your that's origin story, basically. That's amazing. It was one of those movies as well, wasn't it? Reese? I don't know if you found this at the time. It was one of those movies that was almost kind of like spread through word of mouth. Like people were like, you have to see this film. And that's kind of also part of its power. Yes, it? absolutely. And it sort of operates in the way that the, the yeah. videotape does because it's like viral, isn't it, literally? Yeah. And the, like you say, exactly the fact that at the end it's dawned on you that you've seen it as well. And then mm. therefore seven days you're going to see it. And this breaking of the literal the fourth wall is very, um, very frightening to think it's, it's coming for you out of the screen. And it's so relentless and slow. Yes. That's what I always get really scared about, things that are far, start off far away and creep towards you. And you've got time to sort of yes. understand it, process it, not process it, feel like you can't get away from it. And it's mm-hmm. that relentless feeling, which was one of my other choices, actually, for my choice, if you want me to segue into my choice. Yeah. Good. 
Gus. <laughs> was, Such a professional. Well, I, I love know. it. Um, the other choice was going to be the bit in, because I remember it, and it's a sort of similar situation with the best circumstances of watching it, uh, like Dan's um, example when, this is not my choice, but just quickly, it was uh, the TV version of The Woman in Black mm. when she comes down out of the sky. Yeah. Uh, and the, in that horrifying, relentless sort of, she's just floating. And, and I was watching Mark Gatiss put it on one night and said, because I said I'd never seen it. He said, right, we're watching this. And I remember literally just bellowing in <laughs> horror at yeah. the fact that, <laughs> and it's like, it, you, I, I thought, I'll, I'll not look, I'm not it's looking. It's the noise as well. Yeah, it's that, it's that noise. And then I look back, still doing it. <laughs> and it's horrible. It's really frightening. And it's got that sort of low fineness about it, which is yeah. always yeah. scary when you get things that shouldn't be that good and are. Yeah. And you think, why is it frightening me so much? You know. And anyway, that wasn't my choice. My choice is... Um, it, it, this is sort of a jump scare, but it's so beautifully orchestrated and there's so much that goes on invisibly before the thing that is so frightening happens. And it's, it's stuff that's happening and you, 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 don't, you have to watch it. I don't know, are we going to watch it? No, We're not going to watch it. Well, no. go watch it when I describe it to you because it, it's sort of, it's so clever the way that, it, that this, this build up to the scare and the execution at the end is, is orchestrated because things are happening invisibly that just seal your fate as far as being frightened of the moment when it happens. And my film is the um, Exorcist 3 when she comes out with those fucking shears. Those fucking shears. Oh my God. For the nurse. There it is. So this scene, I mean, I'm sorry, you have, you have to cheer this the loudest. But uh, it, it, what's scary is the fact that the, the nurse is at the nurse station locking up for the night. There's a man sat there. There's ice in a bucket that just clinks and it's very quietly done and just very calmly done. You're waiting on something because the shot never changes. She goes to this door to the left goes in, comes out, locks it, and walks away from it. And as she walks away from it, through the door, inexplicably, because the door was shut, subliminally, because you don't see it, this thing in a gown, like a, a comical ghost, but with these huge shears, bone saw shears, marches toward her to chop her head off. And the camera zooms in, and there's this most horrendous scream. And I guess it is a sort of, it's not a diegetic noise, it's a sort of scary noise, therefore, no reason other than to scare you. But you've heard that noise throughout the whole thing, because it's brilliantly scored this film. It's very unsettling. There is an evil around this film, the same way as there is in The Exorcist, that I just think really perfect permeates the whole thing. It's so horrible. Every death counts because people are funny in it yeah. and, you, and there is humour in it and there's absolute horror in it and it's uh, about death and it's about dying and it's about the devil. And this is just depicts, I think, that in that moment, one of the most frightening things I've ever seen depicted to screen. And it's, I, I always brace myself to watch it and it gets me every time and that's something that's really scary if you can't watch it again not knowing it's coming and still find it really frightening to, to get through and then it cuts to this the the um it's the, such a quick cut it's so it's quick it, yeah, yeah and it cuts to the head off on, on the um the yeah. statue isn't it in the archway yeah so that would be my choice it's a it's a, such a good choice yeah, oh great. my god and like you say, it's kind of like a masterclass, isn't it? Like it, it, the use of kind of color and where your eye goes from one end of the frame to the other and how slow that is. And yeah, absolutely, you know? yes. And it is all misdirection. It's like a magic trick, the way yeah. that it slowly just lulls you in into not being ready for it. Yeah, incredible. Um, we've got a roving mic. I would love to get maybe one audience choice. Is there anyone that wants to put forward what they think is the greatest scare in horror? Yes, why don't we go to this lady here? Hello. Hi. Hello. What's your name? Sorry, tell us your name. Elizabeth. Hi, Elizabeth. Um, not to disrespect any of your picks, which are all great. I would just like to nominate um, Hellraiser 1. Um, <laughs> pin, thank you. Pinhead hopping up behind Kirsty and saying, we have such sights to show you. Oh, yeah. And you've seen his beautiful makeup by that point already, but you get a really nice look at it and you hear his voice, which is really scary. And she really sells how scared she is. And it's just a really nice moment. Oh, amazing thank choice. Thank Love you. Hellraiser. <laughs> It's true. I suppose we also kind of take for granted now, like knowing what Pinhead and those Cenobites look like. But you're right. That's kind of the first proper sort of reveal of them, isn't it? Dan, you're a big Hellraiser fan, aren't you? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I think it's, it's interesting. We were talking about sort of sequels earlier as well. And 
you you become used to this stuff and so the way in which the films as they move through franchises the way they can elicit scares from you if they're not going to go down the route of becoming campy and, and silly mm-hmm. um has to become quite varied because the novelty and and also like so much fear is based in the unknown so much fear is based in in not knowing what's going on and that leaving you feeling unsafe unsure mm-hmm. of a situation so when you have such an amazing like design like bradley and the pinhead makeup it like when you when a director gets to show that to an audience for the first time if they land that it's so impactful yeah um it's absolutely fantastic i I think the same with with ring um like it's become a oh was that your other choice by the way yeah yeah that 100 percent was my other choice although we reacted very differently to it um i was given a bootleg of it on vhs by a friend which was Uh. like Amazing. No, like, de- cruel. definitely the best way. No. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I watched it alone on a like a, a labelless tape with a like a, a oh white thing that just said ring on the spine. Oh, okay. People never uh, experience that anymore. Yeah, yeah. And then the landline rings and you go, oh my god. <laughs> yeah. um, and I uh, I immediately watched it a second time, and then I uh, edited the film the the tape out of it the best I could. And then I would buy films in the sale, take them home, put a bit of tape over the thing, splice the ring film into the middle of them. What? Oh my God. And then just put them on the shelf back in the shop in Sam Goody's in Winchester. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, you're a monster. And this is this is about a year, like a couple of months before I ever heard anyone talk about it in England, yeah. and about a year before it got released in England. So I'm sure that there's at least one person out there who was like, "What the fuck?" <laughs> <laughs> when suddenly That's... they worked out what that thing they so I like so it wasn't within a week. You know, they didn't get the the full effect. That's but, amazing. Um, but Mike, Incredible. can I change my choice for um, the? Worst monster. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was about to say we're we're about to get to the ultimate monster. Uh, we'll get to that. And also, um, I don't want to lower the tone, but um, I I have a T-shirt with puzzle box on it that says I have s- such sights to show you across my tits. Hey, there we go. Love it. All right. Well, there we go. So we're going to decide. This is an impossible one, I know. But what is the best scare in horror? Let's have a round of applause for Hellraiser, Pinhead. <laughs> Amazing. Let's have a round of applause for the horrific final act of Audition. Amazing. Uh, the, again, horrific final act of Ring. That's a big one. That's a big one. And finally, that incredible scare from The Exorcist 3. Yeah. I think we're going to go with The Exorcist 3, The Greatest Scare. That's going into the Hall of Fame. Congratulations, Reese, on your choice. Fantastic. Yeah, great. All right. We're going to move on to, the again, a, an impossible one, I know, but the best monster in horror. There's lovely Freddy there with his long arms. You're going to see him later. Um, obviously, the horror genre has been filled with iconic monsters for the last 100 years. We're going to pick our favourites. Rosie, we're going to start with you. Who's your favourite horror monster? Okay, so before I get to my actual choice, so there's um, there's a there are lots of sort of um, studies done in in like psychology about what we are frightened of and what in terms of like creatures and monsters, and it has shown that we are frightened of things that look um, the least like us. Mm regardless of whether they're actually the most dangerous things. So, for example, people are more frightened of spiders than they are of tigers. And before anyone says, yes, but you don't get a tiger in your house, which I do accept... (laughs) I thought you said tights. (laughs) 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 Sorry. (laughs) And Reese was like, I beg to differ. Uh, Tiger. Tigers. Sorry, carry on. Yeah. Um... Although, do we look like tights? No. <laughs> <laughs> like spiders. Well, that's, well, no. We, well, so you don't obviously get, you don't get tigers in your house. But for example, um, a fox or a, a, a or an angry squirrel or a dog is going to do you more harm in this country than a spider. But we don't like spiders because they're weird and they don't look like us and they move weird and like we're frightened of them. Um, so quite a lot of movie monsters sort of go for that. Mm -hmm. However, um, when you go for something that is 
too uncanny and too not like us, it becomes so sort of unreal that it isn't scary. And like, I'm not trying to diss anybody's work, but like Clover from Cloverfield for me is not scary because it's just too other. So it just does, it doesn't feel scary. So to get to my point after rambling on, the, the monster that I've chosen is King Kong. Um, so I love King Kong. And I'm thinking really of the 33 version, but, mm -hmm. but it applies to the other. So the thing with King Kong is that he does look like us. And so he's only a monster in the way that we make him a monster. So in the 33 version, and also in the uh, Peter Jackson one, uh, this is obviously a terrible cliche, but essentially it's the humans who are monsters. It mm. is capitalism who are monsters. It is the film industry who are monsters. But like, so really, you know, he on his island is seen as a god because he's really big, but he's this guy who can pick up a person and in the film, yeah. like bites people in half. He's like a seriously dangerous guy. He kills a lot of people actually in that He, he does kill a lot yeah. of people in like mm. quite sort of graphic ways. Mm. But we see ourselves in him because we, the humans, are the monsters, we think because he looks like us that we can dominate him. And so that is where the problem arises. So he then becomes this kind of perfect cipher for anything, yeah. quite honestly. And so that film is so poignant and so beautiful that it's like left in his own environment he'd be fine and we don't by the way care about the stegosaurus that gets killed mm. we care about him because he looks like us and so when you know the, uh, the most beautiful point is when he's holding Anne Darrow mm. and she's not frightened of him mm. and she and they see something in each other and it's like well if you treated him with humanity he would behave with humanity he's not stupider than us he's no less than us and in his own environment he is a god but we try and take this and we ruin it. And I kind of think that that's, that's why, for yeah. me, Kong, big, yeah. up, big up my Kong. Love that. Amazing choice. Very good. Because, of course, choice. like, monsters don't have to just be these kind of scary villainous things. Like, in so, like uh, Reese, in so much classic horror, we kind of love and sympathise with the monsters, right? That's kind of the point. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. And it's, it's, that's why it's that's such an interesting take, because that is a very different way of looking at what it is that it is to have be, be human regarding the things that we fear, the other. So, yeah, that is, that's a really lovely... Um, Thank you. Incredible choice. choice. Yeah, it's great. great uh, choice. Rhys, let's come to you. What's your favourite monster? Again, it's classic. Um, I thought long and hard, but in the end, I, again, I come back, I often think of things in terms of how... Um, we perceive things and how used to things we are, but then I try to think of the time, I put myself in to the time when they didn't exist in the world and how amazing it is that they do because we're so used to them that they're, they're iconic, but imagine when you first saw, and this is my choice, Max Shrek as Nosferatu. Mm. And he is my monstrous yeah. choice. And in, in a way, you know, it's... Um, just think of the actor and, and the choices that, you know, they filmed that. That wasn't just sort of captured on film, and it, it, but it feels like it. It feels like, I can't mm -hmm. imagine that, that, that there was a catering table and he was there. <laughs> yeah. And it just feels so spooky and so strange and other. When things do that, when you think, I can't imagine the paraphernalia of filming around it, and it seems to have always been there. I think mm -hmm. something else is going on. And that performance is so creepy. Yeah. That I just, you know, I love it. And I, I, feel, I feel like it's one of the, the great things because it's such like a, it's a real sort of testament to a, a moment in time and a performance that you just can't quite fathom what choices were made on. He was so strange and singular and... I'd love to see the outtakes of other choices. Oh my God, can you imagine? But also just the arriving at that look. You know, yeah. they, they robbed Dracula and he decided to do this version of a vampire. Where did it come from? It's so strange. Yeah. His little pernickety little movement. And it's, I just love it as an actor to watch it and think of the strange choices that were made. And, and, and it's so funny as well, you know, we just talked about kind of those more kind of sympathetic monsters. There's not really anything warm or sympathetic about this. No. You know, like there are other vampires that we do feel that about, but Nosferatu, is, it, you, you kind of don't want to be near him, right? There's yeah. Kind of feeling it of feels like, like what you like. the same sort of revulsion of as a rat that you yeah. might be near or something like a spider that, that thing that other and he is there's something beetly about him his eyes look like they've got modern lenses in with dots in you can't quite work out how they've done it yeah. so yeah really good I think it's one of my favourite things one of my Halloween choices every yeah. 
a films to watch at Halloween. So how, he's my monster. How are you feeling about the the new ver- There's a remake, right? And I think it's is it yeah. Bill, Bill Skarsgård. I think is going to be playing Count Orwell. Yeah, very excited. I can't wait. I mean, I, I'd be intrigued to see if there's anything new to it or whether they've just completely faithfully done it again. Yeah. But um, I'm yeah intrigued to see. I'm sure it'll look beautiful with it being Robert Eggers. Absolutely. Yeah. There we go. Amazing choice. There we go. Okay. Count Owlock from Nosferatu. <laughs> Dan, let's hear your choice for monsters. When you're choosing a best monster, <laughs> what are the criteria <laughs> that make a monster good? Is it being horrifying? Is it the pathos that you can get with the sympathy for it? Like, So my choice is a kind of a, a, a mix of things. I think it is probably more so than, because it's going to sound like I'm describing Frankenstein's monster and I'm not, uh, more so than Frankenstein's monster, I feel it's it's my, I think it's a, an amazing tragic, like sad figure in horror. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of pathos in it, but also I think that there's this sort of like stacked fear of the grotesque, but also of things that we innately fear about ourselves, failure, decay, lack of control, all of those things fall into this, and it's the Brundlefly. Oh. And I... Oh. Yeah. Makes me cry every Great. time. Yeah. There's, this, there's this amazing performance from Goldblum at the start. He's this slightly cocky but awkward guy with so much potential, and he feels like he's cracked it, like the world is about to open up for him, everything's different, and for a while it feels like that's where it's going. That's what he's getting, and then it just starts to slip through his fingers but he doesn't realize it as early as we do. And there's that wonderful moment before he's properly Brundlefly where we see mm. just that moment of, of, uh, of dramatic irony where we see that it's all going wrong. And he's proud of the strength and the, he's just all, he's, you know, he's picking little hairs out of himself, but otherwise look at all these chin-ups I could do. <laughs> yeah. But, and, and then it starts to fall apart and it's, it's the, that wonderful moment where she sees the humanity that remains in him as he's sort of like, basically begging to die mm. at the end of the film. And it's to be able to have us feel that close to something that is so absolutely objectively revolting, like watching it, like, you know, vomit up onto that guy and like, like all, that, all that stuff is so effectively unpleasant. It's like, oh, that's disgusting. Yeah, so good. it's horrible. It's, yeah, it, exactly. But like, it's, it's, it's doing that thing. It's really having its cake and then vomiting on it and then eating it too. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Um, yeah, I, I think it's absolutely perfect. It's such an incredible choice, isn't it? Like, I don't think I ever expect, like, Reese, I don't know how you feel, I, I never expect this movie to, to be quite as moving as it is, right? It's one thing to be really gross, but then actually I'm like, oh, I'm actually crying now watching this, you know? Absolutely, yes. Yeah, I think I vote for you. I think we both want to change our choices to that. Oh, there we go. It's great, yeah. I mean, it, and because it's got such heart and, and you feel for this person that can't control it anymore and is yeah. turning but feels, it is so tragic, yeah, it's great, it's, and it's very moving for a it's, horror film. And it's such a fall, because he feels so superhuman, so he, so he gets to fall so far, they build him up so much before he goes. And then just on a technical level, it's incredible oh as well. Like from an effect standpoint, yeah. it's amazing. Um, a, a, a flaw in creatures, creature design in general, they always have rubbish feet. Like if it's a, <laughs> if it's a guy, <laughs> If it's, a, if it's an actor like, playing... Like Mr. Blobby's feet. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Horrifying. Otherwise would have been the best monster. <laughs> <laughs> because of all the real murders. Um, <laughs> but like, but they, they absolutely cracked it uh, with the Brundlefly. His feet are great. <laughs> Incredible. And, and it, it's still my go-to when I'm talking about designing a creature and how you're going to shoot it moving around. It's still my go-to for this is how you do the feet. Do you guys want to know how they did the feet for the Brundlefly? Go on. A light spoiler. So you very, very rarely see the Brundlefly's feet in shot when he's moving around, uh, if you can also see the upper half of the body. Um, so you have a, few, a lot of shots that kind of stop at the knee when he's moving around. Um, and then you have a couple of shots that are full body shots where he's not walking, but you don't see him moving around. And it's because they couldn't fit uh, like human feet inside those feet and still make it ambulatory. So the shots you see when it's walking around is actually someone lying on a sort of a diving board type construction on the front of a trolley with their arms in 
puppets so that they're puppeteering it with their arms. So you've got the wrists being those backward digitigrade legs so that they're moving, so it becomes inhuman. And by editing those two together, you get that perfect shape because trying to hide human feet, which is super recognizable and gross of their, in their own right, um, <laughs> inside a creature's feet always, like there are so many different ways in which it can fail, but it mm. almost always does fail slightly. Love that. Love that. Well, there we go. What an incredible, Brilliant. what an incredible selection of monsters. Uh, we'll put it to the vote, the vote again one more time. So let's hear a cheer for Nosferatu. <laughs> King Kong. And Seth Brundle, AKA Brundlefly. There we go. Brundlefly goes into the EOH Hall of Fame. How lovely. We've got one choice each. Isn't this lovely? There we go. Uh, all right. So we're going to move on to our final category. And, I, you know, I had to do this category. It's a nice kind of segue into the movie we're about to watch. Best slasher movie. Okay. So, uh, you know, we can debate, you know, what does or doesn't define a slasher till we're blue in the face. But I just want to hear what we all think are the, the pinnacle, the best of the slasher movies. So, Reese, we're going to come to you first. What's well, your favorite slasher? Well, just for sort of hitting everything that then becomes sort of the tropes of every slasher, it's got to be Halloween 1978. <laughs> I, I, I didn't really think about it for very long. I just think it's got all that it, it just does everything that has become such a staple. Every scare, every but th there is something much more creepy about. So it, it's very finessed what um, John Carpenter does with how scary Michael Myers is, and there's things in it that a lot of slashes sort of cut away and to pardon the pun, rather than not sort of spend the time. Mm. He spends the time putting Michael. In the, in the sheets in the garden and seeing him, then he's there and he's not there. He's behind the um, far hedge. And it's that stuff that I think is the creepiest parts of, of Michael Myers, when he's outside and she sees him when she's in the classroom. And I, I, it's, it's those moments that unsettle me more than when he's in and there's knitting needles in his eyes and things. But it, obviously it builds to that. So for me, I, I think it's a no-brainer. It's the, this and uh, Haxan are the two films that I watch on Halloween night because you can't beat it, really. It's so evocative of Halloween. You get this brilliant, iconic m monster man. When he was evil and was just this sort of f f thing that, was, that had no eyes of the shape, mm. thank you, um, behind this, the, the evil, the evil that Donald Pleasance talks about. Mm. Dead eyes. Yeah. <laughs> eyes. <laughs> It's before he goes all like, I shot him six times in the sequels and everything. Six times! Because that's the thing, like, how do you find what came after? My cow! <laughs> how do you find what came after, Reese? the 12-ish the, the sequels that we got to this? <laughs> um, well, yeah, law diminishing returns, I guess. I mean, there's something great and you can't help but be sucked in by the franchise of it. And be, you've got loaded emotion about what you want things what you want to happen and the fact that he came back and um, missed dr loomis and it was donald pleasance and he's always valued for money um but then you just when it starts to become superhuman and then you get into the fourth one where it's a cult and mm. they're doing stretching the the ethos of him i can see why they reset with the 2018 version and just yeah. made it that we let's ignore that and, and head chopping off and, and h2o so um I don't know. It, it get there's some there's charm about all of them, and there's iterations. And I like I love the world that was that springboarded all of that. I did like 2018. I hated the second, and and I didn't care much for the third. <laughs> Halloween Kills is one of my banes of my life. <laughs> the, the evil dice the evil tonight. Evil dice tonight. Yeah. yeah. Um, Although I do say that a lot. In, <laughs> every day it's life. really stayed with us, hasn't it? It has, the thing. despite everything, yes. Yeah. So, you know, but uh, you can't beat 1978 just for all the things it does, the boxes it ticked. And the, the way it was done was so uh, cleverly done on a, on a shoestring, presumably. And mm. they, but they do a really good job of, of uh, scaring you with this quite simple look. But, you know, who knew it would be still around today? Yeah, I mean, you can't argue with that choice, right? Halloween, Great. incredible. Dan, let's come to you. You've got, again, a little, little bit more of a left-field choice. Yeah, lightly contentious. Uh, <laughs> Carry on screaming. My, yeah. <laughs> well, you've ruined it now. <laughs> 
Um, I replied with, am I allowed this? I was um, like, you're allowed whatever you want, Dan. You pop it Thanks. in. Thanks. Um, so, are you allowed to call a giallo a thriller? <laughs> is the question. I think they're a subset of... Th- uh, a, a slasher, rather, sorry. Are you allowed to call a giallo a slasher? Um, and I think not all of them, but a lot of them are subsets of slasher. Um, I went for Tenebrae. Um, I think Tenebrae is... It was the first Argento I ever saw. I didn't vibe with it the very first time I saw it. I was quite young. Um, and it wasn't... I didn't... It wasn't until I watched it after I'd gone and watched, like, Bird with Crystal Plumage and Opera and that kind of stuff. And I, I really, really appreciated it on that second watch. Um, I think it does... It plays with narrative structure really, really well, um, which I think works really well for something that has that slightly whodunit like thing, which is present in a lot of slashers. Like, who is this killer? Why are they doing this? And sometimes you get the motive, like in Friday the Thirteenth Part One, um, and sometimes they're supernatural, sometimes they're not. And I like that question mark hanging over them as a as a genre because it it means there's you know all bets are off. It could go either way. Um, but in in Tenebrae, it's got it's almost like the first two acts of one film and then the second two acts of a different film mm. and spotting that transition you don't get that the first time so that really pulls the rug out from under you yeah. um, and then the set pieces are some of Argento's best like it's absolutely gorgeous it's shot beautifully the soundtrack's incredible like there's nothing I don't love about it it's so good isn't it yeah when we talked together Dan about this on the podcast when we talked about the kind of the evolution of the slasher like you wouldn't really have slashers without Jallo, right so well, they are yeah, kind of linked I, I almost I almost went for Bay of Blood Twitch of the Death Note, yeah. which is, you know, the sort of the proto pre slasher. But I think that that is because of its sort of delinear, decentralized uh, like characters. Um, I don't, I think that's a bit, that's a, it's a reach too far for mm. me as far as calling it. Like it, it, slashers wouldn't exist without it. Yeah. But it isn't quite no. a slasher. It's got that like section basically, yeah. hasn't it? Yeah, yeah. 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 Amazing. Excellent choice. Love this. And then, uh, yeah, I love, we get a good range here. Uh, Rosie, give us your choice for best slasher. So I also had to ask Mike if I was allowed. <laughs> yeah. And you also said to me, do what you like. Absolutely. Which do what you like. like. Yeah. Do what you like. Um, so, so I've chosen a film that is arguably um, the greatest horror film of all time. It is. However, is it a slasher? And so what I've chosen is the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Yeah. Now, I'm not going to... I will spend a short time, but not right now, um, telling you why it's the greatest film of all time. But I think that that's not really the point. I think the point is, is it a slasher or is it not? Now, OK, so he doesn't have a knife but he does have a metallic weapon. Mm. He does stalk and carve, if you will, (laughs) one of the people in it. It does have teenagers, and I will definitely argue, and it's also got um, a masked, voiceless, faceless killer who is one of the most iconic killers in horror history, and Um, Marilyn Burns as Sally Hardesty has got to be one of the greatest final girls of all time. So, in my world, it counts. Um, So, and to why it is the greatest, arguably the greatest horror film of all time, and Variety recently put it at the top of their list, and some years ago Total Film put it at the top of their list, is I think that it's basically one of the most pure horror films of all time and I've seen that film four times and I will not be watching that again thank you very much because it is deeply upsetting the first third is all flashes of things and it's a Vietnam movie people wandering through fields saying I've seen things Mm. and then the second half is them the second act is them and the hiker who is so deeply disturbing and it's only towards the, the final act really when they get to the place and it's all full of dead things and we finally meet Leatherface and he grabs her, opens the door, grabs her, slam, bang, gone. God, that right. first moment with the doors opening yeah. is incredible, isn't it? And another part of the argument I would make is that, so we don't have a actual backstory for Leatherface and his family, except we kind of do. And that comes from the form of seeing the drooling cattle mm. and understanding that this is a family who are completely disaffected, who are completely kind of outside of society. And so they are killing these people, not out of revenge, not out of motive, they're killing them as cattle. They, they literally don't see any humanity in these 
people. And I think that, that, that in that comes an incredibly pure um, form. So you don't get your... So, so if I'm going to be killed by a, like a, a knife person, right? <laughs> I want my... Um, I, I want my final act. I want, I want to scream and I want to say something cool and I want to be like, oh, I felt really hard. What I don't want is to be clubbed over the head and that's the end of that, right? I want my death scene. Yeah. And these people don't get their death scenes in the same way as cattle don't get their death scenes. The and way that, it twitches, like, too. It's very undignified, the kind of twitching body after yeah. it's been, you know, whacked. Right, I thought you were talking about my foot for a minute. Like, <laughs> the way oh, you're sorry. twitching, Rosie. Yeah. Oh, is that not dignified enough for you, Michael? Um, so, I th so I think that there is a purity of horror that I do, I would argue, does fit within the slasher genre. You might disagree, but yeah, that's why I say that. No, I think it's a, it's a brilliant case. I mean, like, like you said, it's got the masked killer, it's got the big phallic weapon, it's got the final girl, it's got the body count, right? And what's amazing about that film, why it's like a magic trick, is that you, you feel like you've watched a massacre. You only actually see one person get killed by a chainsaw, maybe yes, two? So, like, no, Franklin is killed by a chainsaw. Yeah, so um, it's not really a chainsaw she's massacre. Hung up on a hook. No, no it's, it's a Texas chainsaw killing off one person and other things. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And a man in a wheelchair going, Sally! Yeah. <laughs> oh, and the last half an hour of that film, and I have timed it, is just screaming. Yeah. The whole thing is just screaming. It's like it's an assault to the senses. Like the very first um, shot before the whole kind of radio stuff with clips is on, the, and then it's too bright in your eyes, and you don't know what you're looking at. And then the very last stuff is her screaming, 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 and then that final shot into the sunlight of that. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah. Incredible. What a film. There we go. Amazing choice. Amazing choices all round. So our final pick for the EOH Hall of Fame Best Slasher Movie. Let's have a round of applause for, first of all, let's go with Tenebrae. Let's go with The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. That's a big one. And finally, Halloween. can't really argue with it, can we? Halloween, congratulations, Halloween. You're going into the Hall of Fame. Amazing. Uh, well, there we go. We've run out of time. We're going to have to wrap this up. We don't have time for any more additional questions, unfortunately. We've got A Nightmare on Elm Street starting imminently. So I, I, just a massive thank you to all of you for being here. Thank you to the Regent Street Cinema for having us. Uh, if you haven't heard The Evolution of Horror, check us out. You can find us wherever you get your podcast. This will be a live episode that's going to drop probably tomorrow. Um, and there's loads more discussions like this one where that came from. So thank you all so much for being here. And a big thank you to my incredible panel of guests, Dan Martin, Rosie Fletcher, Reese Shearsmith. Thank you so much.